Welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. As we follow Jesus together, we experience the Holy Spirit, create a multicultural community, and pursue kingdom of God justice. Night at midnight, we start something big. Uh, We start our week of continuous prayer. I'm excited for what I think Jesus is going to do through this week in us, in us individually, in us as a church. I think Jesus is just happy that we said yes to this that we risked a little bit and that we stepped out into this. And so I think he's going to meet us in that. Uh, And I'm looking forward to speaking to that this morning. Uh, But I also just want to acknowledge that I think probably all of us, at least that are over a certain age, have felt the realities of the election that we just went through and the the strife and the negativity and the prejudice and the kind of anger and just ugliness that was shown throughout the past year plus just on loop. And it wears us down, right? And so, yeah, the election's done, but we still feel it, right? You still feel the weight of it. I think some of us in the room have more hope now that the election's done. Others in the room have less hope now that the election's done. Uh, And I'm grateful that we have a church where those two things are sitting side by side. Let's just acknowledge that. That's a good thing because we're not following a party. We're following Jesus. But we can acknowledge that even in that, that we are far, even in our small sample size, far from unified about our vision for what's the best for this country, right? And so I want to try and speak to both of these situations. So let's see if I can uh, try and and walk a little bit along this. But I want to start with a story. Uh, In the early 1700s, we'll take it way back, however many, let's see, how many many centuries back are we going? Three, Three centuries back in a small village Uh, on the edge of the Czech Republic, there was a community named Hernhut, which Dasha, I'm probably saying that incorrectly, my apologies. Uh, But it was founded by a guy named Count Zinzendorf, which is an amazing name, right? Uh, Count Zinzendorf uh, founded this community with the idea of making it a space where persecuted Christians could come and live at peace. And so it slowly began to fill up. And there were people that would come to this community that were Baptists and Lutherans and Presbyterians and Moravians. Uh, And they would all, they all started building houses right next to each other, living in this village together. And on top of that, the beautiful thing about this is that, and think about it with four different denominations that I just mentioned, they all had one church. So that's going to be fun, right? (laughs) It was no surprise that pretty quickly there started to be a little bit of disagreement about how to do life and just how the church service went on every Sunday. Uh, That was not an enviable uh, role, I don't think, to to pastor, um, if we're being honest. So they started just experiencing a little bit of disquiet. And so Count Zinzendorf decided that he was going to go and visit every single house in the village and just to pray. So he went and met with each one of the families, whoever was living there, and they prayed. They talked about what the Bible says about unity, and then he would go to the next door, and he would do the same thing. Made his way all the way through the village doing that. And... As that's happening, things are starting to get better, but they're not, they're not fixed. There's still some, some serious issues. And so about three months after he did that, Zinzendorf and 14 others had an all-night prayer meeting. The next morning, this 11-year-old girl named Suzanne, who had been praying on her own for their community for three days straight, started all of a sudden having these amazing experiences of the Holy Spirit. And the first place that something started to happen 
was with the kids. And the kids started experiencing what it was that the Holy Spirit was wanting to do in their community. And this revival began. Four days after that, the pastor of their little village church was leading a service, and he said that he felt overwhelmed by the wonderful and irresistible power of the Lord, and he sank down into the dust before God. And with him, the whole congregation sank down. And in this way, they continued until midnight in prayer, singing, weeping, and begging God to move. Everybody just sitting on the dirt, crying out for God to come and to do something. Two weeks later, this village that was struggling to make probably basic decisions around which grape juice to use in their communion service, decided together collectively that they were going to start doing 24-hour prayer. And so they started a rotation, adults and children alike, that lasted for 100 years. Out of that one moment. You see, unity came in God's presence. Count Zinzendorf explained it this way. He said that the Savior permitted to come upon us a spirit of whom we had not before had any experience or knowledge. Before we had been the leaders and the helpers. Now the Holy Spirit himself took full control of everything and everybody. I think regardless of where you're coming from this morning, if you're in this space, even if you're not quite sure why, there's probably at least part of you that's saying, you know, at this point, I'm willing to give the Holy Spirit a chance to be in control of everything and everybody. And so I want to pray for us, invite him to come, and to begin to move in us. So let's pray. God, we just ask that in the, in the, the face of our own disunity and our own brokenness, that you will send the Holy Spirit to come and to take control. Not us, not another uh, human, but you, Holy Spirit, come and be in charge. God, I just pray for those of us here in the room who are feeling uh, just weightiness from, from the election. God, I just pray for you to come and to bring peace and to bring your spirit. God, I pray for those of us in this room who over the past couple of weeks have experienced pain and struggle, either in our own hearts and minds or with people that we love. I just ask for you to come and to bring peace in your presence. God, I just pray that our experienced reality of being in your space today will be that the disquiet, the disunity, the brokenness begins to fade away and that clarity and peace begins to rise up within us. God, I thank you that you are good and that you're here. And we just say we want to encounter you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to be in 2 Chronicles 7, so if you have a Bible, open up. 2 Chronicles 7 is in the Old Testament. It's a few books in, but it's not all that far. And it's a history book. It's a history book about the history of Israel when they had kings. Uh, so it's a little bit of a mixed story. Uh, some of it's good, some of it's not so good, uh, if you read through the whole thing. Uh, and Second Chronicles 7 happens when Solomon, the most famous probably, uh, still to this day, of uh, Israel's kings, he has just finished 
the temple, this place where God was going to come and where they were going to worship him. You see, the Israelites had been worshiping God in tents for about a millennia at this point, and now they had a space, and it was huge, and it was elaborate, and it was very expensive, and it was permanent. And so this is what happens after they uh, kind of dedicate the space. It says in verse 1, When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. When all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down on the ground and they worshiped and praised the Lord saying, he is good and his faithful love endures forever. Essentially, God's saying that he's pleased. And then following that, we're told that the people prayed some more, worshiped some more, and then they partied. And they partied for a long time. And it probably got so expensive for Solomon that he said, fine, time to go home because you guys are eating all of my food. And so he boots them out of the capital city and says, go back to your houses and deal with life on your own. Uh, and he essentially goes to bed, which is what I would probably do after this process too. So verse 11, it says, so Solomon finished the temple of the Lord as well as the royal palace. And he completed everything he had planned to do in the construction of the temple and the palace. And then one night, the Lord appeared to Solomon and he said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifices. At times, I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command grasshoppers to devour your crops or send plagues among you. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name is honored forever. And I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. As I read that, I think that it's kind of... a uh, moment where God the realist shows up and speaks to Solomon. Because God doesn't come and say, like, Solomon, you're so amazing. You finally built me this elaborate, over-the-top, like, gold-encrusted faucets place for me to come and to be. He says, this is good, and you guys are going to screw up sometime. And when you screw up, I'm going to send grasshoppers. And it's not because I'm not happy with what you did, but it's because there's consequences for what you're doing. You'll do things that are contrary to the ways and the commands of God, and consequences will come. It's not his desire that you do that, but this is the reality, the effect of sin in your life. You see, God doesn't promise things that aren't real. He's not Santa. He's not a genie. Uh, he doesn't promise easy lives or uh, a lack of suffering. He's good and kind, but he's real. And he acknowledges that in our lives, we do things that have consequences. Sometimes things just don't go as planned because we live in a world that's fallen where there's sin and evil and brokenness and disease and heartbreak. There's suffering. And all of these things affect our lives and we feel the effects of these things in our lives because we live in a world that is broken. And yet God gives hope because our world isn't supposed to be broken. Our lives aren't supposed to be broken. There's better that he wants for us. And you can begin to hear the echoes of what's to come. 
with a world that's longing for restoration to the way that God wanted it to be, the way that God created it in the very beginning. For a humanity that is crying out and saying, I'm tired of the suffering and the evil. And I want restoration. I want things the way that I kind of feel like it should be. Do you ever feel the crying out that's going on? Maybe in your own heart? Maybe even just in the world, you're like, it's kind of like the earth is like, this is messed up. Like things should be different. There's a longing for something more. We long for Jesus to make things new. But for now, we have to deal with the reality that things are broken. Sometimes there are consequences, but... And here's where the kindness of God shows up, even as he's being a realist. But even though consequences are expected, if my people called by my name. Okay, let me just real quick, because lots of things have been said about this verse. So is this to a specific nation or people group? Yes, it is a dream that was given to Solomon about 1000 BCE, and he was the king of Israel. So yes, I would say it was specifically to the Israelites in about 1000 BCE. Uh, Is it still for a specific nation or people group? Not if you have a Christian New Testament way of reading the scriptures. When you read the New Testament, you see that what Jesus comes to do changes everything. What Jesus comes to do is to bring his kingdom. It's what he preaches about over and over and over again. So much so that everybody gets angry about it because they're like, okay, I get it. You want to change how everything looks. And the coming of the kingdom of God, which Jesus preached about over and over and over again, widen the door to anyone who calls on his name. Any person is welcomed in. So is this a promise for a country like America? Trick question. Is this a promise for Christians who live in a country like America? Yes. And it's also a promise for Christians who live in a country like, we'll say, China or Russia or Zambia or New Zealand or Argentina or even Greenland. Even there... It's a promise for them. It's for all people who will humble themselves, pray, seek his face, and turn from wickedness. Anyone who does that, it says, will be heard from heaven, will be forgiven, and will experience restoration. But the key to this promise is a willingness to do what? To humble, to pray, and to turn. And I think each one of those has something important to us in our lives right now as we go into the week of prayer and as we just live in the world we live in. If my people will humble themselves. Humble means to submit or to get low. Physically to get low. Over and over in the Old Testament, this Hebrew word is used to describe when kings and queens and people in power would finally reach the spot where their power didn't get the results. Maybe it's because they're going along, they're leading, and they're like, everything's wonderful and great. Our economy's great. Oh, wait, we've been in a seven-year famine, and all of a sudden, there's no food. And you know what would happen in those moments, the Bible tells us? They would get low. They would humble themselves. They would submit to God. And they would cry out and say, God, I can't fix this one on my own. I know that you have to be the one to be able to do it. It tells us about these stories where these kings who everything seems to be going okay, and then they go to war against somebody else who has a much bigger army and 
all the fancy things, all the fancy chariots and spears, you know, the trick action spears that they would have. No, I have no idea. But they would come at them. And all of a sudden, we're told that these kings would come and they would be the night before and they can't sleep and they're anxious and they're nervous because they're like, we're going to die tomorrow. And it says that they would humble themselves before God and cry out and ask him to move. It's a word that encourages people with power and rank and status to submit. It's a word that encourages people who are high to get low. Most of us in this room are not good at being humble because most of us in this room are not in a position where we have to be humble very often, right? It's kind of the reality of where we live. Many people in this room manage other people. You run businesses. Uh, you've led large groups of, of people for years. You're not used to walking in, into a room humbly. You're used to walking into the room knowing that you're the one who's making it happen. Many people in this room have some level of wealth, especially maybe compared to other parts of the world. We have power. We don't walk around like we don't have power. And if you don't realize that, again, encounter people who don't have power and see the difference between how they enter into a room. Many people in this room went to college and have at least one degree. Some of us have two degrees, and there's even a few fools who have like three or more. Uh, and wonderful to you. But you're not used to walking into a room and getting low. You know stuff. You've worked for that, right? We don't get low when we enter a room. And on top of that, the Bible tells us that something that we have internalized really, really well that I am grateful for. We're great, I'm grateful that we're told in the Bible that we can enter God's presence with joy and with confidence. And so we come into church and we're like, boom, Jesus, I came. I'm here. Let's talk. Right? We come in with confidence. What do we do when we worship? Do we get on our faces? No, what do we do? All rise. We stand. We look at God. We engage with him. It's good. The Bible tells us to do these things. Sometimes we even sit cross-legged casual because we're like, I'm allowed to be here. He welcomed me in. And all of this is good. But I wonder if we've overemphasized the casual and confident a little bit too much when it comes to being in the presence of God. Because, and I think this might be part of why we've done it, is because we don't live in a culture where humility and deference is a value. We live in a culture where pride and self-confidence is a value. And so we go into God's presence with the same thing that we want to go into work with except I'm not negotiating a business deal. I'm going into the presence of God. And I'm going in with the same attitude. And so God asks us to humble ourselves to get low in his presence. Friends, humility before God requires getting physically low. The Bible tells us this a lot. Psalm 95, 6, for instance, says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Bow. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. We don't do this because a song lyric tells us that we should. We do this because we're coming into the presence of God. In Numbers 20, verse 6, we're told of Moses and Aaron. It says that Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell face down on the ground. Then in the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. When did it appear? When they started walking? No. When they got on their faces. That's when God showed up. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
is so beyond me that I am not worthy of being in his presence. But yet he welcomes me in. And it's a gift. And I'm grateful for that gift. But it doesn't change the reality that he's God and I'm not. And I don't know that we acknowledge that quite enough. What would change in us if we got low in the presence of God regularly? You know, this week, Sarah and I and some of our leaders were at a conference in New Jersey for the Vineyard, and one of the speakers started talking about this. And uh, he, uh, he told a humorous story about trying to get lower than the guy who was next to him, um, and it didn't work out particularly well for him. Um, but as he was talking about this action of getting on your knees before God, something started to happen around the room. And I was just sitting there again in my casual and confident manner, you know, legs crossed, drinking my coffee, chilling, listening to an in engaging story. And he's telling this, story and he, he starts to, to invite us in a bit. And it was interesting because what started happening was around the room, different people started reacting. A couple of people went up to the front and then people started moving. And as I was just sitting there, it was almost like there was this like heaviness that started to just set. And I just felt uncomfortable sitting so I had to do this. And then I like still felt like it was just a little bit much. And so I just got all the way down on my butt, saw, sat cross-legged and just put my head down in God's presence. Because his presence was too much for me to be casual and confident in, in that moment. His presence was heavy in that space. And people all around the room were engaging in a way that in our vineyard style, we don't usually do. But there was something powerful that was happening in that. And friends, I wonder this week, as we go into our week of prayer, what if we allowed ourselves to actually get low in the presence of God? If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Pete Gregg wrote that we don't merely pray about things, we pray towards something, and that something is magnificent. The fulfillment of the Father's purposes and his kingdom come. There's two types of prayers that I want to encourage us to pray towards this week. The first is promises to us as a church, and the second is promises towards you from God, for you individually, maybe for your family. You know, the promises to us as a church. About six weeks ago, a woman named Aisha came and spoke. She's on the 24-7 uh, prayer uh, USA national team. And she came in and just encouraged us as we got towards this week. Uh, and on Friday night, she was speaking to people who were really interested in connecting in and learning more about, about how we're engaging with prayer. And what she did was, at one point, she said, what, are the, what if you spent the week praying for the promises that God has given to your church? And if you were here, you probably remember that moment because it got a little bit more heavy and serious and it, the Holy Spirit was here in it. As different people started calling out things that God had said, like different things like that God's called our church to be this, uh, the vision of like a wheel with spokes going throughout New England. It's a place that sends the kingdom out. There were to be a pillar for the vineyard, our group of churches in New England, a place of healing for those who are hurting, a lighthouse that shines the light of Jesus to the communities around us. I want to encourage you this week, if you're coming and engaging, to be praying for those things to be real, for God to give us what we need to live out the things that he's spoken to us and called us into as a church. But what about the promises that God has given to you? Now, if you're like, I don't know what promises God has given to me, what are you passionate about? 
Because there's probably something in that that's a promise that God gave to you. And everybody else would be like, obviously, Stephen talks about this all the time. Like, that's the thing. We know what it is. What if you prayed into that? Maybe for some of us in the room, though, the promises that we feel like God has given to us are more fragile. They're something that maybe we've, we've longed for, that we've prayed for, for a long amount of time. And our lived reality has not looked like what we thought that it would because of what God spoke to us. Maybe it's related to your kids. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's career things, and you're like, I'm still struggling, God. You said something else. What are the fragile promises that God's given to you that you're carrying that maybe you've been a little bit afraid to pray about because you got kind of burnt? I want to encourage you this week to pick those back up again and to bring them into the presence of God. Because I think God wants to begin to fulfill those things in your life, in the life of your family. He's faithful and true. He doesn't give us empty campaign promises. He speaks life. Trust in the good and kind king to do what it is that he said he was going to do. Pray and seek his face. If my people will humble and pray and seek my face and turn from wickedness. Friends, let's let this week be a week of turning. There is something so powerful in the act of physically giving up the sin and brokenness that we carry with us into the hands of God. Jesus wants it. He died for it. That's the whole like crux of everything. He said he wants to take our brokenness and our sin and to make us new, to reconcile us to him. What if we took this week and made it a space where we said, I'm going to physically turn towards the cross, turn towards the freedom that Jesus brings. On August 13th, 1727, that community in Hernhut had a communion service where Count Zinzendorf, again, winner for best name, uh, he gets up and during the service stands up and begins to awkwardly confess his sins. Out loud. Front of everybody. And suddenly, other people in the church stood up and started awkwardly doing a call and response throwing out their own sins. And all around the building, people were confessing the things that they were carrying with them. And one of the people said that from that time on, Hernhut became a living body of Christ. And Zinzendorf said that we needed to come to communion with a sense of loving nearness of the Savior. Each had become convinced of their lack of worth in the sight of God, and each felt to be, very, to be in the very presence of our noble Savior. Their hearts told them that he would be their priest who was changing their tears into oil of gladness and their misery into happiness, and into this happiness they have since led many thousands. Turn from wickedness. Turn from brokenness. Turn to our Savior. If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wickedness, then I will hear and will forgive their sins and will restore. Friends, the promise if we live out these practices is that God will move and change things. But the most important thing, because we could trust that God will do his end of it. The most important thing for us is that we have to move. 
we have to begin. It's like what Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, once said, that we need to give ourselves wholly to holy things. And what I want us to do, uh, Sarah, if you and the others want to head back to the back, we're going to do a couple of things. But the first thing that I want us to do is I want us just to commit to giving ourselves wholly to holy things. And that's a weighty thing to, to give yourself towards. Are you willing to give your whole self to holy things? To Jesus. So what I want to invite you to do, if you're willing, and you say, yes, I want to do that. Just put out your hands, and I want to just repeat this together. Can you put that last slide up again, Jenny, as we say this together? We're just going to say, Jesus, I give myself wholly to holy things. So if you're willing, just say this with me. Jesus, I give myself wholly to holy things. 